welcome to the One More Thing podcast. Today I'm do- uh, joined with Dr. Troy Doucet. Thanks for being here. No worries, man. Glad to be here as always. So excellent job this weekend, as always. Thanks. You know, we heard in staff meeting, multiple people were mad at you for making them cry yet again. <laughs> so <Yeah. laughs> you have this knack for making people oh, feel man. certain emotions, crying being one of them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but it's, you know, th- one of my favorite series of the year is the Christmas time series because it always talks to m- the most, I think, where most people are at mm-hmm. during the Christmas Christmas time and, and the chaos of surrounding this this month. So it's always a great reminder of these like things like, okay, we need to set our, our values in these specific areas and really focus on that. And because there's, you can get so lost in, in the chaos of Christmas Mm -hmm. in the holiday time. So it's always a great reminder. And then giving being this overarching, um, theme of what you spoke about this weekend. Um, but I wanted to start with this whole concept of pareidolia. Yeah. Because this was the first time when you were, you, I, I know we've talked about pareidolia before, so you, you're the one who enlightened me to this idea. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's such a, it's one of those things that just kind of wrecks your reality. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very OCD, like yeah. in the sense, like I need to control as much as I possibly can. So the fact that I can control like pat, like certain patterns, I'm like, oh yeah. Like when you told yeah. me about the red and black uh, in the casino, I'm like, well then if it's roll, if it's roll black, it's got to roll red the That's next right. time. That's but right. you're like, but why? That's right. Why does it have to roll red? Well, because there's a pattern to everything, right? That's right. No. <laughs> no, there's not. We think there is, yeah. But it, it reminded me, we had a conversation this morning um, about the Shroud of Turin. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was just, I just watched a documentary on this whole idea, this, this article that they discovered. Um, for people who don't know, I just was enlightened to this yesterday afternoon when I was home watching a documentary on this thing called the Shroud of Torin. And so right. what they believed that was the fabric that uh, was Jesus' body was wrapped in uh, when he died. And going through this documentary, you see this constant, uh, with all these people that are, are speaking, like this paradoia mm-hmm. um, phenomena happening, that they're looking for the things, these yeah. patterns to solidify their their belief in this whole concept of like, no, 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 this has to be the fabric. And then at the end of the documentary, they like wreck the whole thing. (laughs) It's like, yeah, most likely wasn't. That's right. Now there's argument, obviously on both sides that it could possibly be that thing, but it was just funny and ironic that we were, now I have this like thing in my mind of pareidolia. That's right. Which where are all these areas of life that I have this pareidolia that I'm like trying to, so thanks for that. Yeah, yeah, man. I no, appreciate that. No, that's all right, man. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 interesting. Like pareidolia, you know, has simplistic manifestations, like a kid looking at a cloud and seeing a unicorn or a teddy bear. But the more complex our pareidolia gets, it, I, I say this loosely, the more dangerous it can be. It's that we begin to associate patterns, and you, it creates a very strong bias, especially when you see patterns that emerge over and over again that you relate back to some deeply held belief or ideology. Right. The Shroud of Turin is one of those. I mean, regardless of what the carbon dating would say, people's pareidolia will relate it to the image that's on the shroud, to what it looks like, to to the event of Jesus' crucifixion. And it bolsters their, their ideology, their faith, right. as opposed to saying, what are some critical analyses that have happened? And I think that's the remedy, right, for our pareidolia is to, to really have a, a critical thought process and in intellectual honesty, man. So, yeah. yeah. No, it's it was good. Um, it's it, it definitely uh, it's definitely made me rethink how I look at certain things. And yeah. you know, as 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 any good um, talk, sermon, whatever monologue, whatever you want to call it, should always like challenge your your thought process. It yeah. all can't be roses and you know make me feel good make me feel good but mm-hmm. like there should be some challenging part of the message as well um but i wanted to explore this idea of jesus creating chaos or god creating chaos um you told the story of the five loaves and two bread uh two loaves of bread uh and i've heard this story yeah you know i've grown up in church i've heard the story all my life and i thought it was an interesting take mm-hmm. on this why why this story uh, you know, surround. We often think of chaos as being things that are just like completely uncontrollable. Right. Um, I'm of the belief, like we we have the wrong sort of epistemology around how I think God creates change in our life. Like people will say, "God, give me patience," mm-hmm. as if there's going to be some sort of divine uh, 
like intervention yeah, into your, like the, some your sort psychology of injection yeah. of, of now I have patience, right. man. Thank you, God. Well, yeah. no, and in fact, God will put you in certain situations to practice patience, mm -hmm. and that's how patience is brought about. The same thing with the chaotic, right? The idea of the chaotic is that we start in Genesis, that tohu vavohu, right? This chaotic element, right, of existence is preeminent, right? It's, it's preexistent to what we know of God's spirit hovering over the waters. So God is the author of the chaos as, as well as the calm, as I said. But in this story, it's as though Jesus intentionally says, here's a problem. There's a lot of people here. It's chaotic. We have at least 5,000 men plus women and children who have left their homes and followed us to this place. Like they, they followed them. They're trying to get away from the crowd so right. they can have some chill time. You know, and the crowd's like, screw that, we're coming. Right. We're coming. We can't get enough. And they're like, that's chaos. And now the chaos is reaching a moment of crisis. Now these people are hungry. I think the disciples are really hungry as well. And they're like, Jesus, send these people away. They're not going to listen to us. They're going to listen to you. Right. And Jesus could. I mean, you think about it. He can walk up and go, listen, guys, go out, get you some food, feel free to come back. That would have been a very orderly, structured, logical way. But Jesus is like, no, no, I have something I want to input, impart, you know, and incite. So I'm going to create a, a bit more chaos amongst the confusion and the crisis. You feed them. You feed them. And immediately like, oh, snap. Wait, Jesus. Like, we don't think you fully understand. It's going to take eight months salary. Uh, these people is too many. And it's that for me is the Christ who creates chaos to bring change, right? And that illuminates something again, I guess, about the heart of God mm -hmm. is, and I said it from the stage, I said, sometimes the miracle of God's provision is found in the midst of our own confusion. You are the answer to the miracle you're asking for a lot of times. Right. But we want which I love that line by yeah, the way. Yeah, we want simplicity. Yeah. We sure. want convenience. I mean, we're 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 sort of indoctrinated that way in this culture. Yeah. But I think God is still the God who creates chaos to bring about change mm -hmm. and challenge in our life. And so Christmas season seems to be the time where we have a heightened sense of awareness of that the chaotic, but like for sure. me, I I'm aware of it year round. Yeah. And I mentioned, you know, moving to Florida, like taking the job here. We knew it would create an element of chaos that we had not experienced before in our life, Esther and I. And we knew it would create a ripple effect of the chaotic for my children and their mom and stepdad in having to be flexible in terms of travel and whatnot. But dude, like when you when you when you get the heart of God the chaotic becomes part of the order. It's not something that's separate from it, right? So it's not like the opposite of it? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, it's, okay. not, it's a, there's no dualism, right? Okay. All For me, all is like this idea of modality, right? Mm -hmm. Oneness. Like God is the God of this and this and mm -hmm. this. And our mind, again, paradoia, like we sort of separate those things as somehow being incongruent or incoherent to one another. And we have to change the way we think to really understand like, the nature of who who God is. Interesting. So, yeah. No, I, I that's really interesting. You told the story. Um, I think it was a couple months ago now on the podcast about the um, the one wealthy gentleman that was had a, a son in your um, youth group, mm -hmm. and you know you talked to him about him coming to Louisiana yeah, to help. Come, yeah, that's right. Yeah. You know, and the easy thing, the or orderly thing, the least chaotic thing for him to do was just write you write a check. The check. Um, but then he decided to throw himself into the chaos, and and that's where the change came. Yeah. And I, and I think if you ask anyone who's gone through some sort of uh, chaotic, traumatic event in their life, they understand, you know, after that how much they've grown, how much yeah. they've changed. So there's there's so much truth to yeah. that concept. Yeah. Um, and and I there is this idea of personal responsibility, mm -hmm. you know, not just throwing your hands up in the chaos and being like, I quit and I'm going to yep. go lay down, but like actually embracing the chaos and saying, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to take up my tools that I've been given and yeah. the things that I've been blessed with and affect change. That's right. You know? So I, I think this was a, is a great like call to action to people as well. I hope so, man. Yeah. You know, and it's, 
Not all chaos is bad, I, I guess is what I'm saying. There's some, like, obvious chaos. Those of us, certain ones of us would disagree yeah, like with a woman, that. <laughs> well, you know, like a woman a woman in, in an abusive relationship that's chaotic, sure. right? Um, that's not a good situation. I don't think that God creates that sort of chaos, right? Hmm. But yet, even in the midst of that chaotic situation, someone has to be brave and leave, right? right. And I think that's one thing that's universal of what it, what chaos brings to our life is is the moment of bravery. Mm -hmm. Like the disciples have a, a choice to make. You know, do we go say, "Hey, we 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 can't feed him," or do we rise to to the level of challenge and do what Jesus commanded us? We can do. Mm -hmm. And they find a little boy who's brought his lunch along, and this little boy becomes, at least in John's gospel, like that element of the brave for us, right? That 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 stereotypical, I have something. And that was the story of Nikki's story as well, is yeah. that I created chaos within our, our, our church leadership to say, we have, we have a responsibility, so let's be brave. Yeah, this is going to create chaos and confusion and contention amongst everyone who has varying beliefs about teen pregnancy and its, its causes and whatnot. But either we're going to be brave or we're going to be, we're going to, we're going to show cowardice or we can take responsibility and see what happens. And it yeah. was it was an amazing, it was miraculous, man. Right. By, by all intents, it was it was a miraculous thing because we chose to be brave in the midst of something that was really truly chaotic. Yeah, I mean, I think that's like such an interesting because I, I do remember that like, you know, if if us as Christians were called to be Christ-like, um, and if if you read the story of Jesus, he's constantly putting himself in the position of helping those. Uh, who haven't helped themselves mm -hmm. in that sense, right? You know, I mean, who did he surround himself with? That's right. The worst of the worst, prostitutes. It, 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 and like you said from stage, it's not that Jesus was condoning their behavior, but he was inspiring them to be better. Yeah. You know, That's right. and, and leave that stuff that is ultimately not, you know, you could use the word sinful, but damaging to themselves. Yeah. You know, it's damaging your heart. It's damaging your body. Um, but he wasn't there like to Mary, Mag, uh, Mary Mag Magdalene. The one that was the prostitute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah Mary Magdalene. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You shouldn't be a prostitute. How dare you? Right. You deserve everything that you get. That's right. No, no he no. like provided this beautiful situation of she's about to be killed for her, the things that she was guilty of doing. Yeah. And he comes and helps her and rescues That's her. That's right. That's right. You know, and I think that is time and time again, you know, there's these stories of Jesus of him creating chaos. Oh, yeah. You know, and even down to him. I mean, yeah. obviously the end of his life, yeah, you know, yeah. you, you, this documentary that I was watching yesterday, they were just talking about the chaos of the situation surrounding Jesus's death. Oh yeah. You know, and the chaos of, you know, here, the, the people that were following Jesus saw him as their King, as their Messiah, the one that was going to usher mm -hmm. them into this, you know, this era of prosperity he was going to be their king and get rid of the romans That's right you know and here he is hanging yeah. on a cross they're confused they're super confused and, and and that was the goal of the romans and that was the goal of the the pharisees was to be like you're not going to get your way yeah order will prevail yeah. our way is going to prevail and then ultimately we know the rest of the story that everything collapsed yeah. and and his you even though they killed jesus his story and the things that he taught those people outlasted him oh yeah and and it it, it did yeah. you know and, and and it inspired us today that's like right. two thousand years later here that's we are right. talking about him you know yeah. and so it's it is amazing like it just shows you know things are not always the, th the way we think that's right that's right you on. know and the the labels that we've put on them that's right so on. that your your sermon was a great reminder of that yeah. Um, was there anything that you weren't able to get to? Was there anything that you did like cut out for the sermon just for time's sake? No, I think this is one of those ones where, you know, staying concise and straightforward. Because my what my goal is every sermon is to to keep that sort of linear thread throughout. The ideas will build on one another. And, you know, it's not a whole lot of time we get, but I think I was able to 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 hit the points I wanted. You know, I think if I would have had more time, I would have spent more time on what that responsibility looks like for the church. Yeah, in a practical standpoint, what do you think? What do you think there are practical things that people could do? Yeah, I think look 
really meditate and think like, what is, what is God really asking of me to give? Not just in Christmas season, but with my life, right? Like, what is he asking me to give? And what are the things that I think restrict me from doing that? And then giving a, 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 a good evaluation to say now, do I trust God with this? What do I have? Because again, I said it in the sermon, Jesus didn't say, now go five, go find 5,000 anchovies to give these guys. Right. He said, go see what you have and bring it to me. Mm -hmm. And so look at what you don't have, right? But then do the positive thing. Look at what you have. What do I have? Do I have time during the week? Do I have any resources? Do I have any talents, right? That I can use to bless someone else, to take responsibility. You know, it goes back to like, you know, Cain and Abel, you know, Cain kills Abel. God shows up and says, where's your brother? Like God doesn't know. Yeah. And Cain goes, man, am I my brother's keeper? In other words, am I responsible for him? And God doesn't answer. He's like, you know the answer to that. Yes, you are. You are. And I think we are responsible for each other to an extent based upon what we have. My responsibility is my ability to respond. And if I don't respond according to my ability, then I'm being irresponsible with what is what I what has been given to me. And that's another thing in closing what I said was we get overwhelmed and we do we feel like if we can't do everything, then we do nothing. Yeah. Yeah. Instead of one thing that could change something or even everything for someone else, you know? And so beautifully so. open that. Yeah, that that's awesome. Well, thank you so much for being on one more thing. You did an excellent job this weekend. Thanks. Man.